break and you lose. And you're you're going to be loose like a goose. <laughs> you're going to be loose, 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 loose. You're going to be so free. You're going to be so free. about giving your life and laying you all on the altar and say, God, I'll go where you want me to go. I'll do what you want me to do. I'll say what you want me to say, and I'll be what you want me to be. Not my will, but thy will be done. Father, we thank you this morning that we can come here, not because of tradition or because of religion or because we had to, because we didn't. Sorry about that, Lord. Because, Lord, we were going to the beach before we came here. We were having a nice day on the beach, free from religion and tradition and religious bondage. But then you gave us a dream of a place where we could just come with no time restraints and we could just come and love you and worship you the way we just really feel we need to. And I'm so thankful that you delivered me. I could be in a dead church today, Lord. Oh, oh my God. I could have been in a dead religious mausoleum with some dry cleaning service, end by 10, out by 11, three hymns, three hers take up the offertory where they preach from the Encyclopedia Britannica and the Reader's Digest, and then pronounce the last rites, and everybody leaves just as dead as what they came. But Lord, today, this is your church. These are your people. <laughs> Thank you. I could, I, I'll be honest with you. I, Lord, I, if you hadn't have done it, I just wouldn't have believed it could be done. But you did it. And it's only the beginning. It's only the beginning. May what you're doing among us, may it help others break out of captivity. Make, may it help others. Oh God, that's our cry. That Sunday mornings would become yours once again. That Sunday mornings would belong to you. Oh God. You're so wonderful. You're so great. You're so mighty. Oh, we don't have enough words in the English language to describe how awesome you are. We could sing for a thousand years and never even come to the edge of your mercy and your grace and how, how great you are. And yet you love us. You love each and every one here this morning. You care for them. You know exactly what they're going through, Lord. You know exactly what they're facing. But you're right there with them. Your friend that sticks closer than a brother. When they get in the automobile and drive out of here, you the extra passenger in the automobile. Oh yeah. When they sit down at lunch, you the extra guest at the luncheon table. <laughs> oh yeah. So what would you want to eat today, Lord? I mean, we just want you to make sure you're at home and we love you and we want you to take your shoes off and just enjoy yourself with us. And uh, Thank you for our friends that have come and to join us today. We give you all of the glory, <laughs> the praise, and the honor. And thank you for the angels that are here this morning as well, the angelic hosts. And uh, I'm a bit of a mess right now, but 
I'll make it. Touch every heart in Jesus' name, and everyone said, Amen. I'm going to give this message a title, and it's really in the form of a question. Have you ever wondered what he was like? Have you ever wondered? Have you ever sat and wondered? What was he like? As a kid growing up in church and listening to preachers preach and then reading the Gospels, I mean, I started seeing a different picture coming out of the Gospels than what I heard coming from the platform. And I heard people say things that Jesus wouldn't do this and Jesus wouldn't do that. But when I read the Gospels and found what he did do, he was, radi he was radical. In actual fact, he'd be kicked out of most churches. They wouldn't invite him to most conferences. He would not be in certain uh, ministerial fellowships. And, hello. Because they couldn't trust him about what he would do. He might, he might, he might just do something totally radical. Hello. Matthew chapter, let's, let's look at chapter 1 first, and then we'll go to chapter 2. Let's look, I want to start right here at verse 18. The birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise when, Mary, when as his mo mother Mary was espoused to Joseph before they came together, she was found with child with the, of the Holy Ghost. Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make a public example, was minded to put her away privately. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, Fear not to take unto thee Mary, thy wife, for that which is conceived of her in, in her is of the Holy Ghost. Now, let's just stop right there. I mean, that in itself, how, how would you like to be Joseph? He's not even married, and his, his lady, Mary, is pregnant. And it's, total, it's a total embarrassment how in the world did she get pregnant? I, I, I'm going to have to put her away. I can't marry this woman, whatever. And then the Holy Spirit comes to him and says, don't. Angel of the Lord, Spirit of God speaking, don't put her away. It's of God. <laughs> now, Joseph wasn't a saint. Neither was Mary. Hello. Try to tell your friends. Mary is pregnant. We're not married yet, but this is different. <laughs> this is not like you think it is. Yeah, I thought about that. I thought, my God. I mean, can you imagine the embarrassment? I mean, if an angel didn't come to him, obviously he would have put her away because, I mean, how do you explain what happened? Who's going to believe you? Who in the world is going to believe you? Never happened before. This is a unique, one of a kind. You're not even married, and, and, and they haven't had marital relationships. Hello. Come on. And she's pregnant. Yeah, right. Don't lie to us, Joseph. Don't come and lie to us. No, I'm telling the truth. An angel came to me and said that, the whole thing is supernatural. The whole thing about this is supernatural. Try to put yourself, come on, try to put yourself in the same position. I try to put myself into Joseph's position and think about, what would I do? What, what would you do? You ladies, put yourself in Mary's position. What you going to go tell Joseph? I'm pregnant, okay. Now listen, I know this is going to sound crazy. I love you with all my heart, but I have not allowed another man to touch me. I'm a virgin but I'm pregnant. Do you understand what we're dealing here with? I mean, these, these people are normal, everyday people. Anyway, thank God for the word of the Lord. And, and obviously there was some shame that they had to uh, endure. Do you, listen, I'm telling you right now, I don't care who the people were, they were talking about it. And there were, listen, I guarantee you right now, there were some people that think that that happened and it was 
because they couldn't wait. I guarantee you right now that there must have even been family members, close friends, neighbors who thought, yeah, we know what Joseph and Mary have been doing. And there's no way you could get by because they, they ain't going to believe what you tell them. Well, I didn't do it. I did not do it. The Holy Ghost did it. I did not do it. And the Lord spoke the word, and that's it. I did not do it. I promise you, before God, I did not do it. Someone said, your mind works in a crazy way. But I mean, I read that, you know, and I'm, I try to put myself into, imagine the family conflict, the moment they broke the news to the, to the parents on both sides of the thing. And uh, like, everybody's going to believe you. Like, yeah, right. There must have been conflict. And uh, she shall bring forth a son, thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now when all this was done, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the Lord, or spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son. Thank God they could go back to the word and say, it says that a virgin shall be with child, bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted God with us. That's who he is. God with us. God manifested in the flesh. Then Joseph, being raised from his sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him and took unto him uh, 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 his wife and knew her not until she brought forth her firstborn son and called his name Jesus. But the Lord had to speak very strongly to Mary and God had to speak very strongly to Joseph. And you know what? When God wants you to do something that's impossible, something that's unique, he'll speak very strongly to you and you might have persecution, you might have faith, but you have the word of the Lord to stand upon and to go with. Can you say amen? Now, let me read another passage of Scripture. Go over with me to John chapter 1. John chapter 1. In the beginning, verse 1, was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was the life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. There was a man sent from God, his name was John. The same came for witness, to bear witness of the, of the light, that all men through him might believe. He was not the light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. You could almost say this in, in the context of the church. He was in the church, and the church was made by him, but the church knew him not in many instances. The Bible says he came unto his own, his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe in his name, which are born not of blood, nor the will of flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. And the Word, the Word, Jesus, was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Now, here's the thing. The world can't see Jesus because he's not here. The world see you as his representative. You are the only Jesus that the world will ever see. You are the only Bible that the world will ever read. If they're going to read the Bible, it's going to be because of your life that was shining the light of the gospel and that stirred them enough to say there must be something about this Jesus that I want to meet him because I know this person and they just, there's something different. They're not like the other people I know. There's something different about their life, the way they walk, the way they talk. I can look in their eyes. There's a spark on their eyes. I, they, they have joy at two o'clock in the morning. They, 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 they have joy at five in the morning. Amen. Mahatma Gandhi said this. He said, if it wasn't for the Christians, all the world would be Christians. Now, that's a sad statement, but very true. Very true. A lot of the wars that are being fought right now are religious wars. 
religious wars. Religion is a killer, man. I'll tell you what right now. There are people today who don't believe that I'm saved because we have joined our meetings. In actual fact, they believe I'm some Eastern mystic uh, swami. Uh, I mean, I know this sounds far-fetched. This sounds like I'm making it up, but I mean, they actually believe that because they don't believe that Jesus would come and bring people joy. I don't know what Bible they've been reading because my Bible tells me joy to the world, the Lord has come. You know, <laughs> I bring you glad tidings of a great joy, you see. And that's why that pattern has been reproduced in the world to where around about Christmas time, everybody's happy. Joy to the world, the Lord has come. Everybody's happy. But then around about April, everybody's sad again. So Jesus is born in December and he gets killed in April, you know. And we have to wait for Christmas time so he could be, the babe can be born again. But by April, they've slaughtered him. He's dead. Easter time, Easter time should be the greatest, happiest time in the church. Because it's, a, it's because he lives we can face tomorrow. Because of the resurrection, that we can have this resurrection life. But you, yet, have you been in the Easter services with my God, you know? Just wheeling the coffin. It's the same. It's the same as communion when people receive the table of the Lord. You, I never, listen, I mean, yeah, at the river, we have different commun types of communion services, but I'll tell you what, right now, you go to traditional time setting and you think God died. Yeah, we remember his death till he comes, but we also remember the fact that up from the grave, he arose. That's what the body speaks to me. The body speaks to me of the fact that he bore my stripes and sicknesses and carried my diseases. And the blood speaks to me that he washed away my sin. And because he lives, I can live also. And, and the life of Christ can live on the inside of me. And come on now, say amen. What was Jesus like? It's historical fact that he existed. But what was he like? In order for me to find out what he was like, I had to go through the Gospels and read them hundreds of times and reread them and reread them and get different translations and reread it. Underline every miracle he did, underline every healing he did, underline every person he got delivered, underline every miracle of provision that he did, underline his words, his sayings, and then underline his doings. I mean, just go there and just spend hours in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John because I wanted to get a picture of Jesus. As a child growing up, there were a lot of things that I wanted questions on or answers on. Questions like, and I know you think this is crazy. For, you mean you thought this while you were a child growing up? Yes. What happened or what transpired in the ministry or the life of Jesus? Can't say the ministry because it hadn't begun. What transpired in the life of Jesus during the formative years? Have you ever thought about that? For 30 years, he's in preparation. What transpired in those early years? What happened? What was it like at the house, living with Jesus, two years old, running around? That's not wrong for me to think that way. I mean, I know he just didn't turn up at the age of 31. He didn't just, it, it wasn't just like that he was beamed down by a transporter. And then suddenly he materialized on the streets or by the Sea of Galilee. I mean, you know, who's this? I'm Jesus, I've come. He comes, God manifests in the flesh, takes on human flesh. Not half God, half man, 100% God and 100% man. Born to die. Can you imagine what it's like to know that you are actually born to die? The whole reason for me to come to this earth is to die. That's why I've come. I have a purpose, I have a goal. I'm heading towards one place and I'm heading towards the cross. Why? Because I have to die for the sin of the world. That's my mission. And, and as a child, to know that, to know that as a child, while you're growing up, you know, I've been born to die. That changes everything. That changes about your desires, your aspirations. And I mean, if you knew that you were born to die, then you, then you would focus in on what you had to do and you would head towards it because you came on a mission.
Can you imagine the conflict of Mary and Joseph trying to deal with this now? He, he's something special. He, they didn't really understand it in its entirety, the word that came unto them and what he was really going to do. I mean, they were just natural human parents and, 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 and wanting the best for their children, you know. If he's going to be a ruler, then he's probably going to be a great politician or he might become governor or he might take over, you know, as king or whatever. And uh, great, I mean, he's going to be a powerful political figure. I mean, you know. But yet his kingdom wasn't of the earth. And the things that interested him were things that had eternal value. Is this helping anybody here? You know, I've spent hours thinking about this. Now, I don't have scripture for some of the things I'm going to share with you, but I'm not making a doctrine, a doctrine out of it. I'm just, I'm just posing. I'm just trying to get your mind. I'm trying to stir your mind up to just think about these things because, you know, I, I wanted some answers for myself. I believe the Lord gave me the answers. I believe I, believe I, I believe I know how he was as a kid growing up. I believe I know how he was by the Spirit. He wasn't religious. I'm, I'm telling you right now, he wasn't religious. You mark that right down. Religion, very word, religion means return to bondage. It's something that you do just repetitive, constant things that you offer up on a daily basis without any life. That's what religion is. Jesus was not like that. Everything he did, everything he did, it was life to it. So the desire of my heart as a child growing up was to find out more about him. I remember praying that he would walk off the page of the gospel, walk in my heart. I wanted to see him. I thought, I wanted to see him. I thought, I've got to see him. I want to see him. But I couldn't. So I had to go to the gospels to see him. I wanted to see him. I wanted to know him. I used to spend time thinking about the conception, the birth, the baby Jesus, what it was like to have him in the house, the boy Jesus, the man Jesus, you know. Now, in John 1, 1, we read, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jesus, prior to Him coming on the scene, taking on human flesh, Jesus didn't come into existence the day that He was born. He pre-existed with the Father. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The three in one. The Father said to the Son, you need to go and pay the price. The son said, I will go. I will take on human flesh. The word was spoken as a seed into the womb of Mary. The word came unto Mary. The word, the seed. The word, the seed that fertilized the egg. Not a seed from a natural man, but a seed, the word of God spoke into the womb of Mary, brought forth Jesus, the God-man, without sin, without spot, without blemish. Why did God have to do it that way? Because man was falling short. Man was, was not getting anywhere. The blood of bulls and goats was not sufficient. Man was there was no daysman betwixt us, Job even said. There was no umpire. There was no mediator. And, and, and Jesus come along and said that the only mediator between God and man is, is me. I'm, I'm the one I come to show you the Father. I come to bridge the gap. I come to bring you back to the Father. In that day, you can ask me nothing, but whatsoever you ask the Father in my name, he'll give it to you because the Father himself loveth you. And I've come to show you what the Father's like. If you see me, you've seen the Father. I and my Father are one. I don't do anything but that I first see my Father do it. Oh, hallelujah. So the Word comes into the womb of a virgin. Nine months later, he comes forth. What is it like? Just like a baby. He didn't fly around the, the, the crib, you know. You know. He, he probably had diapers. I mean, I'm not, what I'm trying to say is you've got to see it in that way. He 
He had to cut his teeth, you know, I mean, the whole thing, man. But with a divine purpose and a divine plan. Now, the Bible doesn't tell us. And, you know, when I get to heaven, I'm pulling out the archives, boy. You mark it down. I'm be, I'll be pulling out them videos. I'm going to watch every single one of them videos. You mark that out. That's one thing I'm going to do. One thing I'm going to do, I'm going to get the video footage of the whole of the, the life of the ministry of Jesus, and I will watch it. I want it. I'm going to go there just to check that if what I've seen is exactly what happened. And I'm, I'm pretty sure it is, but I want to just check it. Because I'm a very inquisitive person. Amen. Nothing wrong with that. The word that was made flesh came and dwelt among us. Hallelujah. I'm so glad he did. For with one purpose, one aim, one goal, and that's to pay the price at Calvary for you and I. Born to die, a remarkable, unparalleled act of love. Never before and not since. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, John 3, 16, that whosoever believed in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And then it says, God sent his son into the world not to condemn the world, but to love and forgive and release the world from sin. That was his whole mission. Yet if you look at preachers today, they think that God sent his son in the world to tell the world, you go to hell, you better repent, you rotten, ugly thing and you're going to burn in the flames and whatever, and they think that's the gospel. Well, Jesus never came with that message. Jesus came with the message, I love you and I forgive you. And again, we can go to the, to the woman caught in adultery. He never said, repent, you ugly thing, whatever. He, just, he said not one word. In actual fact, he wrote in the ground, the Pharisees dropped their rocks, and they left, and then he said, where are your accusers? And, and she said, I don't have any. He said, well, I don't accuse you either. Go sin no more. I mean, that was what he was like. He released people from their sin. He released people from their guilt and condemnation. Now, religion does not release you from your guilt and condemnation. Religion has to make you feel guilty in order for religion to survive because religion is a parasite that can only survive off of your guilt. As long as you're guilty, boy, you will come for help. As long as if you're released, if you're released from your guilt and sin, you'll be free. The power of God will start working on the inside of you. You start casting out devils, raising the dead. And religion don't want you to do that because who do you think you are? Laying hands on the sick and raising the dead and casting out devils. Who do you think you are coming in here and just turning this place upside down? You're not going according to the order that's been set. And that's why when Jesus, he was a total oddity to the religious world. That's why he came in total opposition to the religious system of the day and wreaked havoc. They were the ones that put him in the cross. They were the ones that took him there. They were the ones that said, we've got to get rid of him. He's causing havoc. He's wreaking havoc. But when it wasn't his time, he just walked through the middle of them. They all came to grab a hold of him, and they were like frozen, and he just walked through the middle of them and went on his way, because it wasn't time. When it was time that he went with them, because he was like a lamb that went to the slaughter. He said, okay, it's time to lay my life down. I'm going to go now and lay my life. Then just thinking about his boyhood, growing up in an ordinary family with brothers and sisters, mother and father, his friends. What was it like? Having a supernatural mission coming from heaven, you know, knowing that I'm born to die. Having a time of preparation, knowing that it's not for now. Knowing that you have to be patient. Knowing that there's a set time. When he was a young man of about 13 years of age, you know, and they went up to the temple, had to pay the taxes and and then they couldn't find him. He already knew what his mission was because when they did finally find, find him and they were angry with him, like, where have you been? He said, 
did you not know that I was about my father's business? So even as a young boy, he knew I'm about my father's business. Well, you know, some would say, but your father's business is working in the carpenter shop. What do you mean you're about your father's business? What was it like as a teenager with all the pressures? Listen, teenagers down the years have had pressures. Don't think that we, the teenagers today have more pressure. I know people say that, but let me tell you, the pressure today is a very subtle, deceitful pressure. Do you understand what I'm saying? Back then, they might not have had as many choices, but the world's always been bad. The Bible says it was in days of... Sodom and Gomorrah as it was in the days of Noah, so shall be as the coming son of man. So God says the days are the same. It just means today they've got a lot of other things and sin has become more wicked and more deceitful to go with the technology. Sin has, has even gone through technology to enter into the heart of man. Hello. But sin is sin. Sin, there's no difference between the sin of Adam and Eve and the sin of you and I today. Can you say amen? There's no difference. Sin is sin. You could say sin is in probably a more advanced stage as far as it's got really educated. Men have learned how to devise ways to sin and, and uh, make machines that will help you sin and, and cause with, with motion picture. And do you understand what I'm saying? 200 years ago, there's no motion picture. But today, you know, we have, and I'm, again, I'm not calling all movies bad and of the devil. And that. I'm just saying that it's become more advanced. And, and men will get wicked, wickeder and wickeder in, in these last days. The, men, the, the world will get, I mean, it, it just go from bad to worse because it's the last days. But the church will go brighter and brighter and brighter and more righteous and more holy. Can you say amen? And so the division will come between the world and the church. The problem has been is that the church has been so worldly, the world has been so churchy that you can't even tell the two apart. But the division is taking place even at this time as the Spirit of God is moving and God is doing a work of holiness on the inside. I'm not talking about piety and, you know, the outward form, outward form of religion looking like you holy, but inside you really a whitewash. I mean, on the outside you're whitewashed sepulchre, but really you're full of dead men's bones. I mean, when you open your mouth, all they see is cobwebs. Because it's really what's in the heart of man that made a pure heart, pure man, evil heart, evil man. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good fruit. An evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart brings forth evil fruit. Good man, good heart, good money, bad man, bad heart, bad money. Good man, good heart, good laughter coming out. Bad man, bad heart, bad laughter coming out. So you'll be as bad as what you are on the inside. It will come out of you. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speak. Men speak after the condition of their hearts. That's why you can always hear where people are at is when they open their mouth. You'll see what is planted in their garden, the garden of their heart. You will see what fruit they produce because you know as well as I do that if you get around the wrong type of people, I'm telling you right now, they will have an adverse effect upon you and sow the wrong seeds in your life. And eventually, that's why you have to stop strife in a church situation because if you don't, it'll be like a bad apple in the packet of apples. It'll just start spreading to all the other apples. You have to cut it off at the root. That's why God had to throw Lucifer out of heaven. And the sin had gone so far that it even took a third of the angels with him. God had to get rid of it because when Lucifer was created, he was the anointed cherub that covered. Bible says he was perfect in every way until iniquity was found in him and he was lifted up in pride and felt that he should be higher than God. And God said, okay, he said, actually, Lucifer said five times, I will ascend, I will be high, I will do this, I will do that, I will do that. And God said, you will be brought down to hell. That's where you're going to be brought. And he took him and took a third of the angels and threw them out. 
through the mount. The wrench in the heavens was, was tremendous. Like a thundering, I mean, I can just imagine that day. I could imagine being one of the other angels trembling and just seeing what was happening because God already saw the, even the end of him right at that point of time. But then he didn't send an angel. He didn't send some weak individual to come and do the work. He sent his son. He sent his own son. He sent his own son. He loved his son, but that's, he sent his son because he loved you and I and he sent the best that he had. He gave the best that he had. Jesus is the best that God had to give us. He gave the best. Now the pressure that he must have faced growing up, what about the opposite sex? showing interest in him. Yeah, it's the truth. I mean, if you go study history and you go look at how they were, many of them, boy, they got married young. I mean, they just, you know, they were trained in business from the age of 13. They were ready to take over their father's business. So, I mean, these, those guys started having kids when they were young, man. They didn't, you know, hey, get married, have kids. We already know what we're doing. Some of their wives were chosen for them a long time in advance. While they were growing up, they knew who their wife was going to be, you know. Hello. Parents would get together and meet and discuss, well, you know, I think my son and your daughter go well together. <laughs> Hello. You know, probably the only relief that some of them had was that they could take another wife or three or four of them, you know, so it wasn't like they were just caught with one woman. You know what I'm saying? Because if somebody chose them for you, you know what I mean? If they weren't spiritual, boy, they were, what did you do? My God, do you know who you chose? Some of you need to have a little bit of a sense of humor. I mean, you need to lighten up just a little bit. You know what? You take yourself too seriously. I'm telling you right now, that's why you have all the problems you have, because you take yourself too seriously. What about other people feeling maybe that there was something wrong with him? Maybe, maybe he's... Uh, I mean, he shows no interest in the female. No, no, don't look at me like that. Listen, here he is, 30 years old. He's not even married. He's not married. There's something wrong. What, what's wrong with this guy? Why doesn't he get married? He doesn't show any interest. He doesn't show interest in a trade. He keeps talking about the fact that, the, that his kingdom's not of this earth. Where's this guy come from? Is he from another planet? Are you, are, you, are you in the flow here? Are you in the zone here with me? Are you getting in the group? I want you to see it because, I mean, I've asked myself the question. And you must know. I mean, I, you, you got to know that the young ladies were after him. You got to know that they must have been eyeing him out. You must have known when he walked in the room, they were giving him the glad eye. No interest in the opposite sex. Not really interested in political things. Couldn't really care who's in power, who's not in power. Had no hatred, listen to this now, this will blow you away. Had no hatred for, for the government of the day when really he should have grown up with a chip on his shoulder because all the little Hebrew boys from the age of two years and down had been slaughtered by the Romans, yet Jesus never grew up and said, I'll overthrow these Roman dogs and we'll raise up an army and take him out. He never, never found him even mentioning it once. He didn't even preach about it. Never preached. Never mentioned it. Yet you think it is. Oh, well, you know, you're a preacher. You should preach about these things and whatever. But you see, his eternal purpose was greater than just what was happening there at that time. Don't you understand? God does not see things the way we see things. The things we think are so important. It's not even an issue to him. He's trying to tell you, chill out. That's not the issue. That's not the point. He must have seemed odd. 
differing in, in many ways from his brothers and sisters, not interested in following in his earthly father's footsteps. And the pressures that must have come on him that were forming him and shaping him and preparing him for the greatest mission ever known to men. This is greater than any 007 thriller. This is greater than any spy undercover movie, any infiltration. I mean, here he is, God just coming in because man is falling short. The blood of bulls and goats is not sufficient. And so God sent his son and he infiltrated the whole thing and he came and did it himself. God and man did it himself in one. So that all we had to do is say, I believe, I believe, I believe. And then we say, I believe the thief on the cross. Lord, remember me when you come into the kingdom. Today you'll be with me in paradise. The other guy went to hell. Quick, 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 quick. I believe. You're free. Be forgiven. Be whole. Take up your bed and walk. Be released. Be whole. Rejoice. <laughs> quick. Not, not, not long, drawn out, theological. As we gather today on this place, we thank the Lord. No, none of that stuff. Just roll away the stone. Lazarus, come forth. You know. Very simple, but very direct, very plain, and very demonstrative as far as demonstrating God's power and touching the lives of men and setting the captives free. And everywhere he went, he left a trail of people being set free and delivered and walking and leaping and praising God. And, and uh, we have a count of three people raised from the dead, the widow's boy outside the city of Nain, Jairus' daughter and Lazarus. But I'm telling you, the end of the book of John said all these miracles did Jesus do and all the others that he were written down. I do not suppose that even the books of the world would contain the miracles that he did. So, I mean, it must have been one happy ball just hanging around him from morning, noon, and night. I mean, if I was one of the disciples and we were sleeping out in the field, I'd keep one eye open just to watch in case he did something that I'd, I mean, my God, hanging around this guy is the most awesome thing I've ever seen. It's never a dull moment. He walks on water as a pastime. I mean, that's his job. And then you think, here he is as a young man. What, you know, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22. The whole world resting on his shoulders. At any time, he could have walked away. Even at the cross, he could have called 10,000 angels, but didn't laid his life down gladly and gave it up. Boy, I tell you what, I tell you what. People say, well, that I got saved and served God and had to give up this and give up that. Listen, you ain't give up squat. You ain't give up nothing, man. You, let me tell you what you gave up. You gave up death and hell. You gave up torment. You gave up fear. You gave up lack. You gave up sickness and disease. That's what you gave up. Well, when I started serving God, I had to give up drugs. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like when you were really smoked, man. Like when you were really goofed out of your mind and you thought you were an orange and hid yourself in the closet because you thought somebody was going to eat you. And you stayed there for three weeks. Yeah, yeah, right. You gave something up, didn't you? Yeah. Like when you gave up all your... Uh, your lifestyle of womanizing and every night with a different woman and, 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 and you, you gave up, my God. Listen, what are we talking about? You can't even compare what you think you gave up. You ain't gave up nothing. You ain't gave up nothing, man. You, gained, you haven't lost a thing. You haven't lost a thing. But oh, have you gained. Oh, have you gained. Oh, have you gained. Oh, have you gained. I tell you, this thing lives with me, man. This thing lives with me just like big lives with me. You know what I mean? Believing God for big things. This, this, this has been burning in my heart for a long, long time. And I didn't really want to even preach it because I didn't hear other people preaching along these lines. The whole of mankind resting on your shoulders. The whole of mankind hanging in the balance. The angels of God watching you every move. One wrong move and mankind is lost forever. This is no joke. 
This is serious business here. I'm on a mission. I'm going to die. Because he looked down through time and he saw somebody by the name of Rodney. I'm going to die for him. Get out of my way, sin. Get out of my way. Get out of my way. I can't even talk to you. I can't even yield to you. I can't even just entertain you for one second. I'm on a mission. Because I see somebody down through time, his name is Mike Francine. I'm going to die for him. I see him there hiding behind that big afro. I can already see it. I see him wearing the Florida T-shirt, the Jamaica pants and thong. I'm going to die for him. I'm going to die. I'm going to redeem him. I'm going to set him free. Amen. Knowing that he is the lamb slain before the foundation of the world, Heaven's court of justice is waiting to be satisfied. The price for sin must be paid. Bulls and goats are not sufficient. Somebody has to do it. A mission that we all know that he could have called off at any time. In actual fact, he didn't even have to accept it. Is this helping anybody here today? Have you ever thought some of these things I'm sharing with you? Now the Bible says that Jesus was tempted in all points like we are, yet without sin. So if he was tempted in every point, then he must have been tempted in every point. So that there must have been temptation coming from every angle. Hello. And yet he overcame, yet he resisted temptation. Giving you and I the power to do the same. If he said, be ye holy, we can. He didn't say, be religious. He said, be holy. Now, let me say this quickly, because I, I want to share this, because I've had to deal with ministers who don't want to be religious. Now, I'm just going to be totally frank today. In actual fact, forget Frank, I'll be Rodney. I'll just tell you the truth. You got ministers that realize that religion is, 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 is not good. They love God with their heart. I'm not disputing that fact. But they think, I'm not going to be religious. So what I'm going to do, I'll, I'll cuss, because that'll help me not stay religious. I'll smoke a cigar, and I'll hit the bottle. No, 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 don't look at me like that. That's what they're doing. So they think that they're not religious. If somebody did that, they say, well, he's just not religious. No, 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 he's just a plain sinner. I mean, the bottom line is this. You do not become unreligious by doing sin. Do you understand that? You don't become unreligious. Well, he's just not religious. You've got to understand he's just not religious. No, no, he's just a plain sinner. I mean, the problem... <laughs> Even though Jesus was called a gluttonous man in a wine, but, but he wasn't. Even though Jesus hung out with publicans and sinners, he didn't act like them. But here's what he did. He didn't condemn them either. Nor did he make them feel inferior. That's why they loved to be around him, because they felt that when they were around him, he accepted them without any questions. He didn't even bring up their past. He never brought up their sin. He looked at them with eyes of love, and he treated them with eyes of love. He never, he never, you, when, listen, why is it that today when, when a religious man, a religious man, a man of the cloth, walks in the room, people start, uh, uh, we can't say that or wh whatever. And I understand that there is conviction in the Spirit of God, but... I mean, I'm just talking about somebody who's just religious, who doesn't even have an anointing on their life as far as a demonstration of the power of God or whatever. They don't even believe in the Holy Ghost. If they walked in, oh, we can't say something, you know, Bible punches, yeah, or whatever, you know. And so there's that kind of a conflict that goes on. But yet with Jesus, I mean, he just had an overwhelming and, and, and it was just a love that was beyond any measure that ever known to man. And, and this is the thing that I believe the church has to come to grips with if we're going to see a world shaken for Jesus. Because Jesus made manifest in the way he is through the church, through the picture of religion and tradition, is 
It puts, puts them off. It's repulsive. But Jesus is not repulsive. But religion is repulsive. When you see Hollywood's idea of what they think God's like, where do they get it from? Not from God. They got it from religion. I mean, when I realized this, I said, God, you're going to have to do work in me because, I mean, I, I want to get rid of all the religion and tradition I ever have. My God, I just, I don't want it, I don't want it in my life. I don't want it around me. I don't know, I, I don't know whatever's going to happen. Stick me to the floor for 10 hours, do whatever you want to do, but my God, just take it out of me. I mean, just, you know. I'll tell you what, you know, we did this New York video and people were saying, that were producing the thing in, in the studios in, in Texas. They said, well, I'll tell you one thing about that guy. He doesn't look like a television, television preacher. That's the greatest compliment you could give. Because I'll tell you what I said. They said, he don't look like a television preacher. He don't look like. Thank you, Jesus. If they'd have said it, I'd have quit the ministry. I'd have just said, oh, yeah, he looks like a typical television preacher. I said, oh, I'm out of here, man. He don't look like that. Thank God. Thank God. God. Thank God. I don't ever want to look like that. Now, I'm going to share some things now that are not in the Bible. So please, I don't want you to get upset with me or whatever. And I'm not preaching this as a doctrine. But I mean, maybe this will just help you understand some things. And, and we'll find out anyway when we get to the other side. It's not an issue with me. It's just some things that I'm posing to you. So don't go around and say, he said that Jesus will be. I'm just bringing this up. This is not doctrine. This is not Bible. This is not going to change your salvation. This is not going to change nothing. These are just observations. Do you mind... I remember several years ago getting hold of a book that historically uh, held an account of the life of Jesus during the formative years. And the book spent most of the time in the first beginning chapters bringing validity to the documents because of its historical value. It would be like us, say, a thousand years from now picking up a copy of uh, U.S. News and World Report, you know, of certain facts and things that happened. I'm not, I didn't say the National Enquirer, that's, you know, <laughs> you know, found a tribe in Africa that sings hound dog better than Elvis, you know what I'm saying? I'm not talking about that mess. I'm talking about picking up a book that documents history, okay? like the National Geographic or whatever pictures of how things were, what, you know, any, any, any historical book that recorded events as they happened. And there's no telling what really is hidden. I'm going to say this right now. There's no telling what is really hidden in the historical archives of places like the Vatican and other places that are held tight and closed by religious institutions because they don't want information getting out because they don't want people to see really what did happen. I mean, we have a book at our bookstore down at the RBI that has the unabridged memoirs of Charles Grandison Finney. And when I got the, la the, I had got a set of the memoirs of Charles Finney and read it, and there's no really, they take out, they had taken out most of the manifestations out of that. When we got the unabridged ones, the power of God was falling Charles Finney got hit with the joy. He was staggering around. He was like a drunk man. It's all in his memoirs, but you know what? They had edited it and taken it out because they didn't want that in there. It would mean too much. It's in history. They call me lunatic, but Charles Finney said that when the joy hit him, he took his pocket handkerchief out and put it over his head because he didn't want people to see him laughing because they would not understand that it was irrepressible, holy joy that was causing me to laugh. That was out word for word from Charles Grandison Finney. 
And we've got people today who say that they are really tied into historical Christianity. But I'll tell you what, they don't, they read their edited version of what happened. They take history and re-edit it to make it sound. They would have taken the day of Pentecost. There would have been no mighty rushing wind. There would have been no cloven tongues of fire. They would have just all looked intelligent and spoke very wisely as far as religion and whatever was concerned. Lazarus wouldn't have been dead. He would have been concussed and in a coma. Anyway, as I read this book, this is what really blew me away. And I'm not saying that it's Bible. It's not. But it, I was happy with it. And you know, In the book, it was written by a man by the name of Gamaliel who went around and interviewed people at the time of Jesus. He, he didn't get a hold of Jesus. Every time he came just to get a hold of Jesus, Jesus left. He just never could get hold of Jesus, but he got hold of Mary, got hold of Martha, he got hold of Lazarus, he got hold of a high priest that was retired. Anyway, so when he went to Joseph and Mary, I found this very interesting. He was talking to Joseph and Mary, and he said to Joseph, um, what do you think about Jesus? And Joseph said, well, I'm really concerned, you know, because uh, like he doesn't really even care about his clothes or anything. He's not, he's not caring about the family business. He doesn't seem to have a name in life. And that would really make sense. You know, if you were born to die, then you wouldn't really, you'd look like this. No, this boy's going nowhere. And they were also concerned because he didn't show any interest in the opposite sex. So that concerned them too. Now, I'm not saying this book is right, but you know what? It, it, it helped me see clearer what the questions that I was on. And, and it doesn't matter, you know. I, I was just, I wanted to know. Because I didn't grow up in the world. I grew up serving God. I want to know what he faced. He and Lazarus would spend many, many hours together on top of the roof of the house and talk right through the night talking about scripture. When he was 26 years of age, his friends begged him to start like a Bible study type thing and he wouldn't. But they said whenever he talked, he always spoke and he, he spoke about the surroundings and and whatever, and, and so when he spoke about them, you always became aware of the awesomeness of God. That's what they said when he spoke. And they said, Joseph said, you can never get into fight with him because when the family, growing up, the kids, whatever, if there was a fight in the family, he never got into the fight. He always said one word or a sentence that diffused everything and everybody just looked at each other like they were stupid. Which wouldn't that, wouldn't that, wouldn't that make you think that that's how Jesus was? I mean, even when Joseph said when he really tried to, you know, talk to him or something, Jesus would come back with such an answer that you just couldn't say anything. They went to a high priest, a retired high priest that was down the road. Apparently, Jesus would spend many hours with the retired high priest. And, and they asked him about Jesus. And the high priest said he was, he was, there was not one jot or tittle of the law that he did not know. In actual fact, there was one day, and this was a retired high priest, he knew the law, said that he was quoting something and Jesus said, you got it wrong. And, and he said, no, I haven't got it wrong. And they went and checked and, and, and exactly as Jesus had said, he had left out one piece of it. So, I mean, this is, this is was during the time when he was about 25, 26, 27 years of age. They went to Mary and Martha because, you know, they knew him because he knew Lazarus. They asked, they asked Mary and Martha, did did you know that Jesus is going to be, you know, the king of, of the Jews and what? And, and this was their comment. If he's going to be king, we'd love to be the queen. And then, and then Gamaliel asked them, said, tell me, has he showed any interest in you? And they said, no. In actual fact, we don't understand why. I said, if we try to be close to him, he almost pushes us away, just treats us with disdain. He keeps us at arm's length. Which to me, you know, when I read that, that really dissatisfied me. I mean, I would see him like that. That's what he would do.
Now, I know that some people don't really want to hear this because it doesn't really interest them. They just, you know, religious world, they don't want to hear these things. They're not interested, amen. Hurry up and finish the service. You know, that's what they would say. But you know what? I love to talk about these things because I want to see him as he really is, you see. I want to see him as he really is. I want to see him as he really is. Not through the eyes of religion. If you want to be religious, you can stay religious, man. There's nothing you can do. Let the dead bury the dead. I am being religious. I'll never be religious. I won't, I ain't going that way. My God, I, I come out of that mess. I ain't going ever back there. Not in a hundred million years will I go back there. I'm free of that mess. Shoot that thing in the head. Put that thing out of its misery. Anyway, in this book, it talks about a lot of these things, just what transpired. Jesus would be standing, the book said Jesus would be standing, and wild animals would come up, a deer would walk right up and stand and let him pet the thing. And when the deer was satisfied that it had had enough, it would just walk off. Whereas the other people, it wouldn't come near them, but it would walk up to Jesus. That makes sense because he had no sin in him. Sin, when sin comes at you, it brings fear. It makes you afraid of those things and makes those things afraid of you. Adam and Eve in the garden, Adam named all the animals. <laughs> that means he had to sit down with a lion. I will call you lion. <laughs> and you elephant. You know what I'm saying? I mean, basically, they weren't afraid of him. He wasn't afraid of them. But once sin came, hello. Amen. It split the whole of creation up. What was he like hanging around? Never a dull moment. <laughs> hey, I've got to share this with you, just one other thing quickly. In this book, it talked about what happened after he was raised from the dead, because they interviewed Caiaphas, the high priest. Now, something very interesting. And again, I'm not saying this has happened, but this is what's in the book, okay? And of course, I know that if the religious world, if this really was true, they wouldn't want you to know it anyway. But they interviewed Caiaphas, the high priest, after Jesus had been raised from the dead, and they asked him, said, um, what happened? And he said, well, he said, I was very afraid after Jesus was crucified because I really felt I'd done something wrong. So he said, I went and I hid myself in my house and I put a guard outside the house and the only people in the house was my wife and my father-in-law. And he said, I was in the house and I was really afraid. And he said, the next thing, Jesus appeared to me and come through the wall and appeared and stood right in front of me. And he said, Jesus looked at me with eyes of love. This is all in the book. That he said, melted my heart. And Jesus looked at me and said, tell the priesthood that they have sacrificed the final lamb and that it's all right. And he reported that he said he was overwhelmed by the awesomeness of the love of God and he collapsed in the floor under the weight of this power. And the next thing he remembered was his father-in-law picked him up and stuck him on the bed and Jesus had gone. Now the Bible says when Jesus rose from the dead, he showed himself alive with many infallible proofs. So I'm not saying it happened. I am not saying it happened. I never said this happened. I'm just saying, hello. That's all I'm saying. Oh, the religious world, they'll get mad at me. My God, he's bringing things out. <laughs> fine, fine, whatever. Whatever, man, whatever. What was he like? Never a dull moment adventure from morning to night. Hallelujah. Oh, blessed Jesus. Now, let me begin to close with this this morning because I don't really believe it and, and, and I want to encourage everyone here to study 
extensively the Gospels. How many of you are busy with that right now? You study extensively the Gospels. I encourage you. I don't have all the answers to this. I'm really trying to stir you up so that you can press in to even a greater revelation of who he is and what he was like. And I suppose I could spend more time right now on just talking about what happened the day when he walked down to the River Jordan and John looked up, said, Behold, the Lamb of God which taken away the sin of the world. And Jesus came down and was baptized by John in the River Jordan. And when he came up out of the water, the heavens opened, the Holy Spirit descended like a dove. God spoke out of heaven and said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I'm well pleased. Yeah, he, him. And from that moment of time, his earthly ministry. We could spend all that time talking right through to the resurrection. But I just wanted to, I wanted to bring this out today because... There is a 30-year gap that people don't know what happened to him. Where, where was he? And I just wanted to bring this up to stir your minds and stir your hearts to think about. This is my prayer for you and for everyone that would listen to this tape or watch this video. This is my prayer for you today. Lord, help me to put into words and paint a picture of you that would come alive in the hearts of everyone who would hear this tape or watch this video. Jesus, even just a mention of your name brings worship from my heart to you. I revere you and honor you, my Lord and my Savior. I confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. I confess that Jesus is my Lord and my Savior. I cannot be silent. I will shout it from the mountains and proclaim it from the rooftops. The world is waiting to see you as you really are. Jesus, friend of sinners, Jesus, who loves the unlovely. Jesus, my Savior, my healer, my deliverer, the baptizer in the Holy Ghost, my provider, my King of kings, my Lord of lords, my all in all, my companion and my friend, my shepherd, my soon coming King. When I say that you're awesome, I want you to know that you are more than awesome. When I say that I want to know you, I want to know you with every fiber of my being. I want to see you. I can't wait to see you. I cannot even wait to look into your face. That if the opportunity were given to me right now, I would leave right now and say goodbye to everything that I know and hold dear to me down here on the earth. I would do it in a heartbeat because that desire to see you and to know you is stronger than anything else that I have in life. I want the world to meet you as you really are because I know if they meet you, they'll never be the same. I want them to see you as you really are, Jesus, because I know they'll come running. They'll come running. They, they, I, know, I know that I would hear them say, if we had known he was like this, we would have come a long time ago. Oh, Jesus, if only we had known you were like this, we would have come a long time ago. I want the world to know you. They need you so desperately. I want the world to accept you. It'll change eternity for them. Jesus, you mean everything to me. Words cannot express. If I had to do it all over again, I would still serve you. If there, even if there was not a heaven, even if there were no streets of gold, even if there was no promise of eternal life, I would still choose the path and would still serve you because you are so awesome and you've been so wonderful to me and you've been the best friend I've ever had and you are just amazing. I mean, you amaze me all, every day. You amaze me. You astound me. You shock me. You blow me away. You're greater than any wonder in the world. You're so awesome, Jesus. Friend of sinners. Friend of mine. <laughs> you calm the storm in my life with one word. You make the difference. You make life worth living. I love you so much. Forgive me if in the past I portrayed you in a way that I shouldn't have.
forgive me if I represented you or misrepresented you because I didn't mean to. I just didn't know you like I do now, know you now, and I promise you that I'm going to know you better. I promise you. To fall in love with him. To fall in love with Jesus. Not to serve him out of fear. Not to serve him out of guilt. Not to serve him out of condemnation. To fall in love with Jesus. How awesome. That's why I never had a problem with the joy when it broke out. I love him so much. He's awesome. When he walks into somebody's house, the atmosphere changes. Everything that's wrong is made right automatically. You might be sitting there depressed and confused and he walks in and suddenly confusion leaves. Depression goes. He says, be a good cheer. Rise. Take up your bed and walk. Be free. No wonder the song says, oh, for a thousand tongues to sing my, my, my great Redeemer's praise. I mean, my God. If we took the whole of eternity and we just stood in front of him all the time trying to tell him how awesome he is, we couldn't even, we, we don't have the vocabulary. There's not enough words in the English language. There's not enough words in the English language to tell people how awesome he is. Our tongue falls short. He's greater. He's greater. He's more awesome. I knew if Evangelist, my Francine, was preaching now, you'd say, oh, you people aren't serious. You know, I'm not worried about you because I'm, I'm in the zone here. I'm locked in. I'm having a ball. I'm just having me some fun here today. I'm talking about my best friend. If, you know, if it, don't, if, if it don't crank you, if it don't get you, son, that's your problem, baby. You better, get, you better get real with God. You better get on fire for God. I mean, you're in trouble. If it don't move you, that's, that's not my problem. Hey, I'm not going to come down to the level of people's lukewarmness for anything in the world. I, I'm sorry. I, you know, hey, forget about it, baby. I'm in love with Jesus, and that's the bottom line, you know. They can call me anything under the sun. I know what I know. I know what I believe. And I know in whom I have believed. Can you say amen? Hallelujah. 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 I'm not just talking about somebody that is some... People get more excited about some Hollywood superstar or somebody coming out of the movie. My God, there he goes. Arnold Schwarzenegger, whatever, you know, I'll be back, or whatever they, you know, they get excited about. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. I'm talking about Jesus. I'm talking about our Savior, our Redeemer, our Healer, our Deliverer. I'm talking about the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Hallelujah. Oh, but Brother Rodney, I mean, don't you think 15-part series on the subject of Jesus is getting a little thin? Oh, I think we'll probably go 100 parts on this thing over the next couple of years. I mean, I'm telling you right now, this, this is it, folks. Because you know what? If you could see him, if you could see him, if he can come alive on the inside of you, if he can stand up big on the inside of you, then he can shine through you. He can shine through you. He can shine through you. I want him to shine through me. Don't you want him to shine through you? Hallelujah. 
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Jesus, friend of sinners, friend of mine. Don't you just love him? Don't you just love him? Hallelujah. I don't mean to take my time, but you know what? I, I can't help it, you know, because... I mean, I'm just so in love with him. I just can't stop talking about him. I mean, he's just totally phenomenal. And, and, and the problem is, I really feel I'm doing a pretty bad job today in even describing how he is. I mean, I don't think I've done what I really should have done here today. Because all of what I've said is not enough. It's not enough. It's not enough. And I know that if this church can see him as he really is. Oh. Oh, my God. Yeah. My prayer is that when people look at you, they see Jesus in your eyes. They hear Jesus in your voice. They feel Jesus in your touch. Somebody said, but Brother Rodney, it's not that way right now. I know, but you see, we've got to be trained. That's why we've got to be trained from glory into glory. But you know, aim for it. Aim for it. Aim for it. Aim for it. Shoot for the mark. Press for the mark. Press for the mark. I might not be that way. I might not be that way right now, but I'll tell you what, I'm getting more, 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 more. Who oh, being conformed into his image, changed from glory unto glory. Hallelujah. Just stick around, he's not finished with me yet. Yes. I'll tell you what, he's done a lot over the last, you know, 12, 15, 16, 18, 20 years, but he ain't finished with it yet, with me yet, boy. I'll tell you right now, you hang on, hold on to your britches, it's gonna change, you know, it's gonna happen, it's gonna happen. Hallelujah. Conform to his image, Hallelujah. conform to his likeness. Hallelujah. 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 Not just me, not just some of the other minister gifts here, not just some of the people that are close to this ministry, every single one from the least to the greatest in the church, if there be any levels, uh, from the least, from the littlest child in the building to the lowliest person in their estimation or whatever, because we all are nothing in the eyes of God, really. I mean, all men are the same. God doesn't treat this one greater, that one not. He treats everyone the same. So I'm just telling in man's distinctions, man's God has no distinction. In man's distinction, from the rich to the poor, from the educated to the uneducated, that all would reflect him as he really is, that the world would see, that Tampa would wake up to the fact that Jesus is alive and well, and that he's living on planet Earth. He's living in each and every believer. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah! While heads are bowed and eyes are closed, right now, I just felt the Lord told me, He said, call all those today who have allowed other things to creep in and are not in love with me like they should. But today they want to come back to that first love that they once had when they first got saved. If you're not now, of course, you need to come anyway. If you're not saved, you need to come anyway. And only you can answer that. I'm not going to stand there and beat you up and try to make you feel guilty or pull some sins out of the can so that I can find something that covers your life so that you can feel, oh, yeah, he read my mail. I think I need to go down there. Either you're in total love with him or you just know that you've been kind of lukewarm. You've just been kind of going through the motions. If you would please now come from where you are and come stand all in between the two sets of stairs here because I'm going to lead you in a prayer here today. How many others sitting here today, God's really spoken to you just in a very special way today? Come on. And you feel a stirring within your heart? Fine. I'm 
I want you to lift your hands to heaven right now and pray this prayer together with me. Say, Dear Lord Jesus, I come to you today. I stand here. I present myself to you, spirit, soul, and body. I have a cry of my heart. I want to know you more. I want to know you as I've never known you before. And I want to fall in love with you. Jesus, be my Lord and my Savior. Not just something that I say from my head, but something that I know in my heart. Jesus, Lamb of God, friend of sinners, friend of mine, thank you for dying for me on the cross of Calvary. Thank you that today you look at me with eyes of love and mercy and compassion and that you forgive me. And I receive by faith forgiveness of my sin right now. I repent and turn my back on the world and the things of the world and I decree and declare to you now I will have no other gods before me, but I put you as number one in my life. Jesus, my Lord, my Savior, my Deliverer, my soon coming King. Wash me now in your blood. Cleanse me from every guilt and every stain. And I accept, I accept the cleansing. I commit today to renew my mind to your word, to take your word, to hide it in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Jesus, my Lord and Savior. Jesus, friend of sinners, friend of mine. I love you. I love you. Now just lift your hands and love him right now. Let him give you a big hug right now. Just love him. Give them a big love, Lord. Just love them. Love them, Jesus. These are your children. They love you, Lord. Love them. Love on them. Love them. Let heaven come down and kiss everyone standing here right now. love the work of the Spirit of God. Don't you love the work of the Holy Ghost? You have a song? I was looking for you. I looked over there. I thought, listen to this now. This is what I heard. I'm going to tell you because I just said I love the Holy Ghost. I looked over there. I thought, Keith Holliday is not here. My God, he was supposed to sing a song. I felt he was supposed to sing a song. So I thought, okay, he's gone. So I th uh, anyway, that's what I heard. And then I turned around and there he is. So you better come sing the song you're supposed to sing because the Lord told me Keith Holliday is supposed to sing a song right now. Thank God for the Holy Ghost. Don't you love the working of the Holy Ghost? I love the working of the Holy Ghost.
every moment. 